part two chapter four of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part two chapter four one now i am really afraid to tell my story it all happened long ago and it is all like a mirage to me now how could such a woman possibly have arranged a rendezvous with such a contemptible urchin as i was then yet so it seemed at first sight when leaving liza i raced along with my heart throbbing i really thought that i had gone out of my mind the idea that she had granted me this interview suddenly appeared to me such an obvious absurdity that it was impossible for me to believe in it and yet i had not the faintest doubt of it the more obviously absurd it seemed the more implicitly i believed in it the fact that it had already struck three troubled me if an interview has been granted me how can i possibly be late for it i thought foolish questions crossed my mind too such as which was my better course now boldness or timidity but all this only flashed through my mind because i had something of real value in my heart which i could not have defined what had been said the evening before was this to-morrow at three o'clock i shall be at tatiana pavlovna's that was all but in the first place she always received me alone in her own room and she could have said anything she liked to me there without going to tatiana pavlovna's for the purpose so why have appointed another place of meeting and another question was would tatiana pavlovna be at home or not if it were a tryst then tatiana pavlovna would not be at home and how could this have been arranged without telling tatiana pavlovna beforehand then was tatiana pavlovna in the secret this idea seemed to me wild and in a way indelicate almost coarse and in fact she might simply have been going to see tatiana pavlovna and have mentioned the fact to me the previous evening with no object in view but i had misunderstood her and indeed it had been said so casually so quickly and after a very tedious visit i was for some reason overcome with stupidity the whole evening i sat and mumbled and did not know what to say raged inwardly and was horribly shy and she was going out somewhere as i learnt later and was evidently relieved when i got up to go all these reflections surged into my mind i made up my mind at last that when i arrived i would ring the bell the cook will open the door i thought and i shall ask whether tatiana pavlovna is at home if she is not then it's a tryst but i had no doubt of it no doubt of it i ran up the stairs and when i was at the door all my fears vanished come what may i thought if only it's quickly the cook opened the door and with revolting apathy snuffled out that tatiana pavlovna was not at home but isn't there someone else isn't there someone waiting for her i wanted to ask but i did not ask i'd better see for myself and muttering to the cook that i would wait i took off my fur coat and opened the door katerina nikolaevna was sitting at the window waiting for tatiana pavlovna isn't she at home she suddenly asked me in a tone of anxiety and annoyance as soon as she saw me and her face and her voice were so utterly incongruous with what i had expected that i came to a full stop in the doorway who's not at home i muttered tatiana pavlovna why i asked you yesterday to tell her that i would be with her at three o'clock i i have not seen her at all did you forget i sat completely overwhelmed so this was all it meant and the worst of it was it was all as clear as twice two makes four and i i had all this while persisted in believing it i don't remember your asking me to tell her and in fact you didn't ask me you simply said you would be here at three o'clock i burst out impatiently i did not look at her oh she cried suddenly but if you forgot to tell her though you knew i should be here what has brought you here i raised my head there was no trace of mockery or anger in her face there was only her bright gay smile and a look more mischievous than usual though indeed her face always had an expression of almost childish mischief there you see i've caught you well what are you going to say now her whole face seemed to be saying i did not want to answer and looked down again the silence lasted half a minute 
have you just come from papa she asked i have come from anna andreevna's i haven't been to see prince nikolai ivanitch at all and you know that i added suddenly did anything happen to you at anna andreevna's you mean that i look as though i were crazy but i looked crazy before i went to anna andreevna and you didn't recover your wits there no i didn't and what's more i heard that you were going to marry baron Buring. did she tell you that she asked with sudden interest no it was i told her i heard nash chokin tell prince sergey so this morning i still kept my eyes cast down and did not look at her to look at her meant to be flooded with radiance joy and happiness and i did not want to be happy indignation had stung me to the heart and in one instant i had taken a tremendous resolution then i began to speak i hardly knew what about i was breathless and spoke indistinctly but i looked at her boldly my heart was throbbing i began talking of something quite irrelevant though perhaps not incoherently at first she listened with a serene patient smile which never left her face but little by little signs of surprise and then of alarm passed over her countenance the smile still persisted but from time to time it seemed tremulous what's the matter i asked her noticing that she shuddered all over i am afraid of you she answered almost in trepidation why don't you go away i said as tatiana pavlovna is not at home and you know she won't be you ought to get up and go i meant to wait for her but now really she made a movement to get up no no sit down i said stopping her there you shuddered again but you smile even when you're frightened you always have a smile there now you are smiling all over you are raving yes i am i am frightened she whispered again frightened of what that you'll begin knocking down the walls she smiled again though she really was scared i can't endure your smile and i talked away again i plunged headlong it was as though something had given me a shove i had never never talked to her like that i had always been shy i was fearfully shy now but i talked i remember i talked about her face i can't endure your smile any longer i cried suddenly why did i even in moscow picture you as menacing magnificent using venomous drawing-room phrases yes even before i left moscow i used to talk with marie ivanovna about you and imagined what you must be like do you remember marie ivanovna you've been in her house when i was coming here i dreamed of you all night in the train for a whole month before you came i gazed at your portrait in your father's study and could make nothing of it the expression of your face is childish mischief and boundless good nature there i have been marvelling at it all the time i have been coming to see you oh and you know how to look haughty and to crush one with a glance i remember how you looked at me at your father's that day when you had arrived from moscow i saw you then but if you were to ask me how i went out of the room or what you were like i could not tell you i could not even have told whether you were tall or short as soon as i saw you i was blinded your portrait is not in the least like you your eyes are not dark but light it's only the long eyelashes that make them look dark you are plump you are neither tall nor short you have a buxom fullness the light full figure of a healthy peasant girl and your face is quite countrified too it's the face of a village beauty don't be offended why it's fine it's better so a round rosy clear bold laughing and bashful face really bashful bashful of katerina nikolaevna amakov bashful and chaste i swear more than chaste childlike that's your face i've been astounded by it all this time and i've been asking myself is the woman so too i know now that you are very clever but do you know at first i thought you were a simpleton you have a bright and lively mind but without embellishments of any sort another thing i like is that your smile never deserts you that's my paradise i love your calmness too your quietness and your uttering your words so smoothly so calmly and almost lazily it's just that laziness i like i believe if a bridge were to break down under you you would say something in a smooth and even voice i imagined you as the acme of pride and passion and for the last two months you've been talking to me as one student talks to another i never imagined that you had such a brow it's rather low like the foreheads of statues but soft and as white as marble under your glorious hair 
your bosom is high your movements are light you are extraordinarily beautiful but there's no pride about you it's only now i've come to believe it i've disbelieved in it all this time she listened to this wild tirade with large wide-open eyes she saw that i was trembling several times she lifted her gloved hand with a charming apprehensive gesture to stop me but every time she drew it back in dismay and perplexity sometimes she even stepped back a little two or three times the smile lighted up her face again at one time she flushed very red but in the end was really frightened and turned pale as soon as i stopped she held out her hand and in a voice that was still even though it had a note of entreaty said you must not say that you can't talk like that and suddenly she got up from her place deliberately gathering up her scarf and sable muff are you going i cried i'm really afraid of you you are abusing she articulated slowly and as it were with compassion and reproach listen on my honour i won't knock down the walls but you've begun already she could not refrain from smiling i don't even know if you will allow me to pass and she seemed to be actually afraid i would not let her go i will open the door myself but let me tell you i've taken a tremendous resolution and if you care to give light to my soul come back and sit down and listen to just two words but if you won't then go away and i will open the door to you myself she looked at me and sat down again some women would have gone out with a show of indignation but you sit down i cried in exultation you have never allowed yourself to talk like this before i was always afraid before i came in now not knowing what i should say you imagine i'm not afraid now i am but i've just taken a tremendous resolution and i feel i shall carry it out and as soon as i took that resolution i went out of my mind and began saying all this listen this is what i have to say am i your spy or not answer me that question the colour rushed into her face don't answer yet katerina nikolaevna but listen to everything and then tell the whole truth i had broken down all barriers at once and plunged headlong into space two two months ago i was standing here behind the curtain you know and you talked to tatiana pavlovna about the letter i rushed out and beside myself i blurted out the truth you saw at once that i knew something you could not help seeing it you were trying to find an important document and were uneasy about it wait a bit katerina nikolaevna don't speak yet i must tell you that your suspicion was well founded that document does exist that is to say it did i have seen it your letter to andronikoff that's it isn't it you've seen that letter she asked quickly in embarrassment and agitation when did you see it i saw it i saw it at Kraft's. you know the man that shot himself really you saw it yourself what became of it Kraft tore it up in your presence did you see him yes he tore it up probably because he was going to die i did not know then of course that he was going to shoot himself so it has been destroyed thank god she commented slowly with a deep sigh and she crossed herself i was not lying to her that is to say i was lying because the letter in question was in my hands and had never been in Kraft's. but that was a mere detail in what really mattered i did not lie because at the instant i told the lie i nerved myself to burn the letter that very evening i swear that if it had been in my pocket that moment i would have taken it out and given it her but i hadn't it with me it was at my lodging perhaps though i should not have given it her because i should have felt horribly ashamed to confess to her then that i had it and had been keeping it and waiting so long before i gave it back it made no difference i should have burnt it at home in any case and i was not lying i swear that at that moment my heart was pure and since that's how it is i went on almost beside myself tell me have you been attracting me have you been welcoming me in your drawing-room because you suspected that i knew of the letter stay katerina nikolaevna one minute more don't speak but let me finish all the time i've been coming to see you all this time i've been suspecting that it was only because of that that you made much of me to get that letter out of me to lead me on to telling you about it wait one more minute i suspected it but i suffered your duplicity was more than i could bear for i found you a noble creature i tell you plainly i was your enemy but i found you a noble creature i was utterly vanquished but your duplicity that is the suspicion of your duplicity was anguish now everything must be settled 
everything must be explained the time has come for it but wait yet a little longer don't speak let me tell you how i look at it myself just now at this moment i tell you plainly if it has been so i don't resent it that is i mean i'm not offended for it's so natural i understand you see what is there unnatural or wrong about it you were worried about a letter you suspected that so-and-so knew all about it well you might very naturally desire so-and-so to speak out there's no harm in that none at all i am speaking sincerely yet now you must tell me something you must confess forgive the word i must have the truth i want it for a reason and so tell me why did you make much of me was it to get that letter out of me katerina nikolaevna i spoke as though i were falling from a height and my forehead was burning she was listening to me now without apprehension on the contrary her face was full of feeling but she looked somehow abashed as though she were ashamed it was for that she said slowly and in a low voice forgive me i did wrong she added suddenly with a faint movement of her hands towards me i had never expected this had expected anything rather than those two words even from her whom i knew already and you tell me you did wrong so simply i did wrong i cried oh for a long time i've been feeling that i was not treating you fairly and indeed i'm glad to be able to speak of it for a long time you've been feeling that why did you not speak of it before oh i did not know how to say it she smiled that is i should have known how she smiled again but i always felt ashamed because at first it really was only on that account that i attracted you as you expressed it but very soon afterwards i felt disgusted and sick of all this deception i assure you she added with bitter feeling and of all this troublesome business and why why couldn't you have asked me then straightforwardly you should have said you know about the letter why do you pretend and i should have told you at once i should have confessed at once oh i was a little afraid of you i must admit i did not trust you either and after all if i dissembled you did the same she added with a laugh yes yes i have been contemptible i cried overwhelmed oh you don't know yet the abyss into which i have fallen an abyss already i recognize your style she smiled softly that letter she added mournfully was the saddest and most indiscreet thing i ever did the consciousness of it was a continual reproach moved by circumstances and apprehension i had doubts of my dear generous-hearted father knowing that that letter might fall into the hands of malicious people and i had good reasons for fearing this she added hotly i trembled that they might use it might show my father and it might make a tremendous impression on him in his condition on his health and he might be estranged from me yes she added looking me candidly in the face and probably catching some shade in my expression yes and i was afraid for my future too i was afraid that he under the influence of his illness might deprive me of his favour that feeling came in too no doubt i did him an injustice he is so kind and generous that no doubt he would have forgiven me that's all but i ought not to have treated you as i did she concluded again seeming suddenly abashed you have made me feel ashamed no you have nothing to be ashamed of i cried i certainly did reckon on your impulsiveness and i recognize it she brought out looking down katerina nikolaevna who forces you to make such confessions to me tell me that i cried as though i were drunk wouldn't it have been easy for you to get up and in the most exquisite phrases to prove to me subtly and as clearly as twice to make for that though it was so yet it was nothing of the sort you understand as people of your world know how to deal with the truth i am crude and foolish you know i should have believed you at once i should have believed anything from you whatever you said it would have cost you nothing to behave like that of course you are not really afraid of me you know how could you be so willing to humiliate yourself like this before an impudent puppy a wretched raw youth in this anyway i've not humiliated myself before you she enunciated with immense dignity apparently not understanding my exclamation no indeed quite the contrary that's just what i am saying oh it was so wrong so thoughtless of me she exclaimed putting her hand to her face as though to hide it i felt ashamed yesterday that's why i was not myself when i was with you the fact is she added that circumstances have made it absolutely essential for me at last to find out the truth 
about that unlucky letter or else i should have begun to forget about it for i have not let you come to see me simply on account of that she added suddenly there was a tremor at my heart of course not she went on with a subtle smile of course not i you very aptly remarked arkady makarovitch that we have often talked together as one student to another i assure you i am sometimes very much bored in company i have felt so particularly since my time abroad and all these family troubles i very rarely go anywhere in fact and not simply from laziness i often long to go into the country there i could read over again my favourite books which i have laid aside for so long and have never been able to bring myself to read again i have spoken to you of that already do you remember you laughed at my reading the russian newspapers at the rate of two a day i didn't laugh of course not for you too were excited over them and i confess too long ago that i am russian and love russia you remember we always read facts as you call them she smiled though you are at times somewhat strange yet sometimes you grew so eager and would say such good things and you were interested just in what i was interested in when you are a student you are charming and original nothing else suits you so well she added with a sly and charming smile do you remember we sometimes talked for hours about nothing but figures reckoned and compared and took trouble to find out how many schools there are in russia and in what direction progress is being made we reckoned up the murders and serious crimes and set them off against the cheering items we wanted to find out in what direction we were moving and what would happen to us in the end in you i found sincerity in our world men never talk like that to us to women last week i was talking to prince x about bismarck for i was very much interested and could not make up my mind about him and only fancy he sat down beside me and began telling me about him very fully indeed but always with a sort of irony and that patronizing condescension which i always find so insufferable and which is so common in great men when they talk to us women if we meddle with subjects beyond our sphere do you remember that we almost had a quarrel you and i over bismarck you showed me that you had ideas of your own far more definite than bismarck's she laughed suddenly i have only met two people in my whole life who talked to me quite seriously my husband a very very intelligent and honourable man she pronounced the words impressively and you know whom versilov i cried i hung breathless on every word she uttered yes i was very fond of listening to him i became at last absolutely open perhaps too open with him but even then he did not believe in me did not believe in you no no one has ever believed in me but versilov versilov he did not simply disbelieve in me she pronounced dropping her eyes and smiling strangely but considered that i had all the vices of which you have not one no even i have some versilov did not love you so he did not understand you i cried with flashing eyes her face twitched say no more of that and never speak to me of of that man she added hotly with vehement emphasis but that's enough i must be going she got up to go well do you forgive me or not she added looking at me brightly me forgive you listen katerina nikolaevna and don't be angry is it true that you are going to be married that's not settled she said in confusion seeming frightened of something is he a good man forgive me forgive me that question yes very don't answer further don't vouchsafe me an answer i know that such questions from me are impossible i only wanted to know whether he is worthy of you or not but i will find out for myself ah listen she said in dismay no i won't i won't i'll step aside only this one thing i want to say god grant you every happiness according to your choice for having given me so much happiness in this one hour your image is imprinted on my heart for ever now i have gained a treasure the thought of your perfection i expected duplicity and coarse coquetry and was wretched because i could not connect that idea with you i have been thinking day and night lately and suddenly everything has become clear as daylight as i was coming here i thought i should bear away an image of jesuitical cunning of deception of an inquisitorial serpent and i found honour magnificence a student you laugh laugh away you are holy you know you cannot laugh at what is sacred 
oh no i am only laughing because you use such wonderful expressions but what is an inquisitorial serpent she laughed you let slip to-day a priceless sentence i went on ecstatically how could you to my face utter the words i reckoned on your impulsiveness well granted you are a saint and confess even that because you imagined yourself guilty in some way and want to punish yourself though there was no fault of any sort for if there had been from you everything is holy but yet you need not have uttered just that word that expression such unnatural candour only shows your lofty purity your respect for me your faith in me i cried incoherently oh do not blush do not blush and how how could any one slander you and say that you are a woman of violent passions oh forgive me i see a look of anguish on your face forgive a frenzied boy his clumsy words besides do words matter now are you not above all words versilov said once that othello did not kill desdemona and afterwards himself because he was jealous but because he had been robbed of his ideal i understand that because to-day my ideal has been restored to me you praise me too much i don't deserve this she pronounced with feeling do you remember what i told you about your eyes she added playfully that i have microscopes for eyes and that i exaggerate every fly into a camel no this time it's not a camel what you are going she was standing in the middle of the room with her muff and her shawl in her hands no i shall wait till you're gone and then i shall go afterwards i must write a couple of words to tatiana pavlovna i'm going directly directly but once more may you be happy alone or with the man of your choice and god bless you all that i need is my ideal dear good arkady makarovitch believe me i my father always says of you the dear good boy believe me i shall always remember what you have told me of your lonely childhood abandoned amongst strangers and your solitary dreams i understand only too well how your mind has been formed but now though we are students she added with a deprecating and shamefaced smile pressing my hand we can't go on seeing each other as before and and no doubt you will understand that we cannot no we cannot for a long time we cannot it's my fault i see now that it's quite out of the question we shall meet sometimes at my father's you are afraid of my impulsiveness my feelings you don't believe in me i would have exclaimed but she was so overcome with shame that my words refused to be uttered tell me she said stopping me all at once in the doorway did you see yourself that that letter was torn up you are sure you remember it how did you know at the time that it was the letter to andronikoff craft told me what was in it and even showed it to me good-bye when i am with you in your study i am shy of you but when you go away i am ready to fall down and kiss the spot where your foot has touched the floor i brought out all at once unconsciously not knowing how or why i said it and without looking at her i went quickly out of the room i set off for home there was rapture in my soul my brain was in a whirl my heart was full as i drew near my mother's house i recalled liza's ingratitude to anna andreyevna her cruel and monstrous saying that morning and my heart suddenly ached for them all how hard their hearts are and liza too what's the matter with her i thought as i stood on the steps i dismissed matvey and told him to come to my lodging for me at nine o'clock end of part two chapter four part two chapter five of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnett part two chapter five one i was late for dinner but they had not yet sat down to table they had waited for me perhaps because i did not often dine with them some special additions to the menu had been made on my account with the savouries there were sardines and so on but to my surprise and regret i found them all rather worried and out of humour liza scarcely smiled when she saw me and mother was obviously uneasy versilov gave me a smile but it was a forced one 
had they been quarrelling i wondered everything went well at first however versilov only frowned over the soup with dumplings in it and made wry faces when he was handed the beef olives i have only to mention that a particular dish does not suit me for it to reappear next day he pronounced in vexation but how's one to invent things andrei petrovitch there's no inventing a new dish of any sort my mother answered timidly your mother is the exact opposite of some of our newspapers to whom whatever is new is good versilov tried to make a joke in a more playful and amiable voice but it somehow fell flat and only added to the discomfiture of my mother who of course could make nothing of the comparison of herself with the newspapers and looked about her in perplexity at that moment tatiana pavlovna came in and announcing that she had already dined sat down near mother on the sofa i had not yet succeeded in gaining the good graces of that lady quite the contrary in fact she used to fall foul of me more than ever for everything and about everything her displeasure had of late become more accentuated than ever she could not endure the sight of my foppish clothes and liza told me that she almost had a fit when she heard that i kept a coachman and a smart turnout i ended by avoiding meeting her as far as possible two months before when the disputed inheritance was given up to prince sergey i had run to tatiana pavlovna meaning to talk over versilov's conduct with her but i met with no trace of sympathy on the contrary she was dreadfully angry she was particularly vexed that the whole had been given back instead of half the fortune she observed sharply i'll bet you are persuaded that he has given up the money and challenged the prince to a duel solely to regain the good opinion of arkady makarovitch and indeed she was almost right i was in reality feeling something of the sort at the time as soon as she came in i saw at once that she would infallibly attack me i was even inclined to believe that she had come in expressly with that object and so i immediately became exceptionally free and easy in my manner this was no effort to me for what had just happened had left me still radiant and joyful i may mention once and for all that a free and easy manner never has been right for me that is to say it never suits me but always covers me with disgrace so it happened now i instantly said the wrong thing with no evil intent but simply from thoughtlessness noticing that liza was horribly depressed i suddenly blurted out without thinking of what i was saying i haven't dined here for such ages and now i have come see how bored you are liza my head aches answered liza good gracious said tatiana pavlovna instantly catching at it what if you are ill arkady makarovitch has deigned to come to dinner you must dance and be merry you really are the worry of my life tatiana pavlovna i will never come again when you are here and i brought my hand down on the table with genuine vexation mother started and versilov looked at me strangely i laughed at once and begged their pardon tatiana pavlovna i take back the word worry i said turning to her with the same free and easy tone no no she snapped out it's much more flattering to be a worry to you than to be the opposite you may be sure of that my dear boy one must learn to put up with the small worries of life versilov murmured with a smile life is not worth living without them do you know you are sometimes a fearful reactionary i cried laughing nervously my dear boy it doesn't matter yes it does why not tell the blunt truth to an ass if he is an ass surely you are not speaking of yourself to begin with i can't judge any one and i don't want to why don't you want to why can't you laziness and distaste a clever woman told me once that i had no right to judge others because i don't know how to suffer that before judging others one must gain the right to judge from suffering rather exalted but as applied to me perhaps it's true so that i very readily accepted the criticism 
wasn't it tatiana pavlovna who told you that i cried why how do you know said versilov glancing at me with some surprise i knew it from tatiana pavlovna's face she gave a sudden start i guessed by chance the phrase as it appeared later actually had been uttered by tatiana pavlovna the evening before in a heated discussion and indeed i repeat i had brimming over with joy and expansiveness swooped down upon them at an unfortunate moment all of them had their separate troubles and they were heavy ones i don't understand it i went on because it's all so abstract it's dreadful how fond you are of abstract discussion andrei petrovitch it's a sign of egoism only egoists are fond of generalization that's not a bad saying but don't persecute me but let me ask i insisted expansively what's the meaning of gaining the right to judge any one who is honest may be a judge that's my idea you won't find many judges in that case i know one anyway who's that he is sitting and talking to me now versilov laughed strangely he stooped down to my ear and taking me by the shoulder whispered he is always lying to you i don't know to this day what was in his mind but evidently he was in some agitation at the time in consequence of something he had learned as i found out later but those words he is always lying to you were so unexpected and uttered so earnestly and with such a strange and far from playful expression that it gave me a nervous shudder i was almost alarmed and looked at him wildly but versilov made haste to laugh well thank god murmured my mother who was uneasy at seeing him whisper to me i was almost thinking don't be angry with us our kasha you'll have clever friends apart from us but who is going to love you if we don't love one another the love of one's relations is immoral mother just because it's undeserved love ought to be earned you'll earn it later on but here you are loved without every one suddenly laughed well mother you may not have meant to shoot but you hit your bird i cried laughing too and you actually imagined that there's something to love you for cried tatiana pavlovna falling upon me again you are not simply loved for nothing you are loved in spite of loathing oh not a bit of it i cried gaily do you know perhaps some one told me to-day i was loved said it laughing at you tatiana pavlovna said suddenly with a sort of unnatural malignity as though she had just been waiting for me to say that yes a person of delicacy especially a woman would be moved to disgust by the uncleanness of your soul your hair is done with a smart parting you have fine linen and a suit made by a french tailor but it's all uncleanness really who's paid your tailor's bill who keeps you and gives you money to play roulette with think who it is you've been so shameless as to sponge on my mother flushed painfully and i had never seen a look of such shame on her face before everything seemed to be giving way within me if i am spending money it's my own and i am not bound to give an account of it to any one i blurted out turning crimson whose own what money's your own if it's not mine it's andrei petrovitch's he won't refuse it me i borrowed from what prince sergey owes andrei petrovitch my dear boy versilov said firmly all of a sudden not a farthing of that money is mine the phrase was horribly significant i was dumbfoundered oh of course considering my paradoxical and careless attitude at that time i might quite well have turned it off with some outburst of generous feeling or high-sounding phrase or something but i suddenly caught on liza's face a resentful accusing expression an expression i had not deserved almost a sneer and a devil seemed to prompt me you seem i said turning to her suddenly to visit daria onisimovna very often at prince sergey's flat miss so will you be pleased to give her this three hundred roubles which you've given me such a nagging about already to-day i took out the money and held it out to her 
but will it be believed that those mean words were uttered entirely without motive that is without the faintest allusion to anything and indeed there could have been no such allusion for at that moment i knew absolutely nothing perhaps i had just a desire to vex her by something comparatively most innocent by way of a gibe since you are such an interfering young lady wouldn't you like to return the money yourself to the prince a charming young man and a petersburg officer as you are so anxious to meddle in young men's business but what was my amazement when my mother got up and with a menacing gesture cried how dare you how dare you i could never have conceived of anything like it from her and i too jumped up from my seat not exactly in alarm but with a sort of anguish a poignant wound in my heart suddenly realizing that something dreadful had happened but unable to control herself mother hid her face in her hands and ran out of the room liza followed her out without so much as a glance at me tatiana pavlovna gazed at me for half a minute in silence can you really have meant to jeer she exclaimed enigmatically looking at me in profound astonishment but without waiting for me to answer she too ran out to join them with an unsympathetic almost angry expression versilov got up from the table and took his hat from the corner i imagine that you are not so much a fool as an innocent he mumbled to me ironically if they come back tell them to have their pudding without waiting for me i am going out for a little i remained alone at first i felt bewildered then i felt resentful but afterwards i saw clearly that i was to blame however i did not know exactly how i was to blame i simply had a feeling of it i sat in the window and waited after waiting ten minutes i too took my hat and went upstairs to the attic which had been mine i knew that they that is my mother and liza were there and that tatiana pavlovna had gone away and so i found them on my sofa whispering together about something they left off whispering at once when i appeared to my amazement they were not angry with me mother anyway smiled at me i am sorry mother i began never mind mother cut me short only love each other and never quarrel and god will send you happiness he is never nasty to me mother i assure you liza said with conviction and feeling if it hadn't been for that tatiana pavlovna nothing would have happened i cried she's horrid you see mother you hear said liza with a motion towards me what i want to tell you both is this i declared if there's anything nasty in the world it's i that am nasty and all the rest is delightful ah kasha don't be angry darling but if you really would give up gambling you mean gambling i will give it up mother i am going there for the last time to-day especially since andrei petrovitch himself has declared that not a farthing of that money is his you can't imagine how i blush i must go into it with him though mother darling last time i was here i said something clumsy it was nonsense darling i truly want to believe it was only swagger i love christ on my last visit there had been a conversation about religion mother had been much grieved and upset when she heard my words now she smiled at me as though i were a little child christ forgives everything arkasha he forgives your wrongdoing and worse than yours christ is our father christ never fails us and will give light in the blackest night i said good-bye to them and went away thinking over the chances of seeing versilov that day i had a great deal to talk over with him and it had been impossible that afternoon i had a strong suspicion that he would be waiting for me at my lodging i walked there on foot it had turned colder and begun to freeze and walking was very pleasant two i live near the vaznesensky bridge in a huge block of flats overlooking the courtyard almost as i went into the gate i ran into versilov coming out 
as usual when i go for a walk i only get as far as your lodging and i've been to piotr ipolitovich's but i got tired of waiting for you your people there are forever quarrelling and to-day his wife is even a little tearful i looked in and came away for some reason i felt annoyed i suppose you never go to see any one except me and pietra ipolitovich you have no one else in all petersburg to go to my dear fellow but it doesn't matter where are you going now i'm not going back to you if you like we'll go for a walk it's a glorious evening if instead of abstract discussions you had talked to me like a human being and had for instance given me the merest hint about that confounded gambling i should perhaps not have let myself be drawn into it like a fool i said suddenly you regret it that's a good thing he answered bringing out his words reluctantly i always suspected that play was not a matter of great consequence with you but only a temporary aberration you are right my dear boy gambling is beastly and what's more one may lose and lose other people's money too have you lost other people's money i have lost yours i borrowed of prince sergey from what was owing you of course it was fearfully stupid and absurd of me to consider your money mine but i always meant to win it back i must warn you once more my dear boy that i have no money in prince sergey's hands i know that young man is in straits himself and i am not reckoning on him for anything in spite of his promises that makes my position twice as bad i am in a ludicrous position and what grounds has he for lending me money and me for borrowing in that case that's your affair but there is not the slightest reason for you to borrow money from him is there except that we are comrades no other reason is there anything which has made you feel it possible to borrow from him any consideration whatever what sort of consideration do you mean i don't understand so much the better if you don't and i will own my boy that i was sure of it brisson la mon cher and do try to avoid playing somehow if only you had told me before you seem half-hearted about it even now if i had spoken to you about it before we should only have quarrelled and you wouldn't have let me come and see you in the evenings so readily and let me tell you my dear that all such saving counsels and warnings are simply an intrusion into another person's conscience at another person's expense i have done enough meddling with the consciences of others and in the long run i get nothing but taunts and rebuffs for it taunts and rebuffs of course don't matter the point is that one never obtains one's object in that way no one listens to you however much you meddle and every one gets to dislike you i am glad that you have begun to talk to me of something besides abstractions i want to ask you one thing i have wanted to for a long time but it's always been impossible when i've been with you it is a good thing we are in the street do you remember that evening the last evening i spent in your house two months ago how we sat upstairs in my coffin and i questioned you about mother and makar ivanovitch do you remember how free and easy i was with you then how could you allow a young puppy to speak in those terms of his mother and yet you made not the faintest sign of protest on the contrary you let yourself go and so made me worse than ever my dear boy i am very glad to hear such sentiments from you yes i remember very well i was actually waiting to see the blush on your cheek and if i fell in with your tone it was just to bring you to the limit and you only deceived me then and troubled more than ever the springs of purity in my soul yes i'm a wretched raw youth and i don't know from minute to minute what is good and what is evil had you given me the tiniest hint of the right road i should have realized things and should have been eager to take the right path but you only drove me to fury cher enfant 
i always foresaw that one way or another we should understand one another that blush has made its appearance of itself without my aid and that i swear is better for you i notice my dear boy that you have gained a great deal of late can it be the companionship of that princeling don't praise me i don't like it don't leave me with a painful suspicion that you are flattering me without regard for truth so as to go on pleasing me well lately you see i have been visiting ladies i am very well received you know by anna andreyevna for instance i know that from her my dear boy yes she is very charming and intelligent mais brisons la mon cher it's odd how sick i feel of everything to-day spleen i suppose i put it down to hemorrhoids how are things at home all right you made it up of course and embraces followed cela va sans dire it's melancholy sometimes to go back to them even after the nastiest walk in fact i sometimes go a longer way round in the rain simply to delay the moment of returning to the bosom of my family and how bored i am there good god how bored mother your mother is a most perfect and delightful creature may in short i am probably unworthy of them by the way what's the matter with them to-day for the last few days they've all been out of sorts somehow i always try to ignore such things you know but there is something fresh brewing to-day have you noticed nothing i know nothing positive and in fact i should not have noticed it at all if it hadn't been for that confounded tatiana pavlovna who can never resist trying to get her knife in you are right there is something wrong i found liza at anna andreyevna's this morning and she was so she surprised me in fact you know of course that she visits anna andreyevna i know my dear and you when were you at anna andreyevna's to-day at what time i want to know for a reason from two till three and only fancy as i was going out prince sergey arrived then i described my whole visit very circumstantially he listened without speaking he made no comment whatever on the possibility of a match between prince sergey and anna andreyevna in response to my enthusiastic praise of anna andreyevna he murmured again that she was very charming i gave her a great surprise this morning with the latest bit of drawing-room gossip that madame amakov is to be married to baron buring i said all of a sudden as though something were torn out of me yes would you believe it she told me that news earlier in the day much earlier than you can have surprised her with it what do you mean i was simply struck dumb from whom could she have heard it though after all there is no need to ask of course she might have heard it before i did but only imagine she listened to me when i told her as though it were absolutely news to her but but what of it hurrah for breadth one must take a broad view of people's characters mustn't one i for instance should have poured it all out at once and she shuts it up in a snuff-box and so be it so be it she is none the less a most delightful person and a very fine character oh no doubt of it every one must go his own way and something more original these fine characters can sometimes baffle one completely just imagine anna andreyevna took my breath away this morning by asking whether i were in love with katerina nikolaevna amakov or not what a wild and incredible question i cried dumbfounded again there was actually a mist before my eyes i had never yet broached this subject with him and here he had begun on it himself in what way did she put it no way my dear boy absolutely no way the snuff-box shut again at once more closely than ever and what's more observe i've never admitted the conceivability of such questions being addressed to me nor has she however you say yourself that you know her and therefore you can imagine how far such a question is characteristic do you know anything about it by chance i am just as puzzled as you are curiosity perhaps or a joke oh quite the contrary it was a most serious question hardly a question in fact more a cross-examination and evidently there were very important and positive reasons for it won't you be going to see her couldn't you find out something i would ask you as a favour do you see 
but the strangest thing is that she could imagine you to be in love with katerina nikolaevna forgive me i can't get over my amazement i should never never have ventured to speak to you on this subject or anything like it and that's very sensible of you my dear boy your intrigues and your relations in the past well of course the subject's out of the question between us and indeed it would be stupid of me but of late the last few days i have several times exclaimed to myself that if you had ever loved that woman if only for a moment oh you could never have made such a terrible mistake in your opinion of her as you did i know what happened i know of your enmity of your aversion so to say for each other i have heard of it i have heard too much of it even before i left moscow i heard of it but the fact that stands out so clearly is intense aversion intense hostility the very opposite of love and anna andreevna suddenly asks point-blank do you love her can she have heard so little about it it's wild she was laughing i assure you she was laughing but i observe my dear boy said versilov and there was something nervous and sincere in his voice that went to one's heart as his words rarely did that you speak with too much heat on this subject you said just now that you have taken to visiting ladies of course for me to question you on that subject as you expressed it but is not that woman perhaps on the list of your new acquaintances that woman my voice suddenly quivered listen andrei petrovitch listen that woman is what you were talking of with prince sergey this morning living life do you remember you said that living life is something so direct and simple something that looks you so straight in the face that its very directness and clearness make us unable to believe that it can be the very thing we're seeking so laboriously all our lives with ideas like that you met the ideal woman and in perfection in the ideal you recognized all the vices that's what you did the reader can guess what a state of frenzy i was in all the vices oh ho i know that phrase cried versilov and if things have gone so far that you are told of such a phrase oughtn't i to congratulate you it suggests such a degree of intimacy that perhaps you deserve credit for a modesty and reserve of which few young men are capable there was a note of sweet friendly and affectionate laughter in his voice there was something challenging and charming in his words and in his bright face as far as i could see it in the night he was strangely excited i beamed all over in spite of myself modesty reserve oh no no i exclaimed blushing and at the same time squeezing his hand which i had somehow seized and was unconsciously holding no there's no reason in fact there's nothing to congratulate me on and nothing of the sort can ever ever happen i was breathless and let myself go i so longed to let myself go it was so very agreeable to me you know well after all i will just this once you are my darling splendid father you will allow me to call you father it's utterly out of the question for a son to speak to his father for any one in fact to speak to a third person of his relations with a woman even if they are of the purest in fact the purer they are the greater the obligation of silence it would be distasteful it would be coarse in short a confidant is out of the question but if there is nothing absolutely nothing then surely one may speak mayn't one as your heart tells you an indiscreet a very indiscreet question i suppose in the course of your life you've known women you've had intimacies i only ask generally generally i don't mean anything particular i blushed and was almost choking with delight we will assume there have been transgressions well then i want to ask you this and you tell me what you think of it as a man of more experience a woman suddenly says as she is taking leave of you casually looking away to-morrow at three o'clock i shall be at a certain place at tatiana pavlovna's for example i burst out taking the final plunge my heart throbbed and stood still i even ceased speaking i could not go on he listened eagerly and so next day at three o'clock i went to tatiana pavlovna's and this is what i thought when the cook opens the door you know her cook i shall ask first thing whether tatiana pavlovna is at home 
nithicook says tatiana pavlovna is not at home but there's a visitor waiting for her what ought i to conclude tell me if it were you in short if you simply that an appointment had been made you then i suppose that did happen and it happened to-day yes oh no 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 nothing nothing of the sort it did happen but it wasn't that it was an appointment but not of that sort and i hasten to say so or i should be a blackguard it did happen but my dear fellow all this begins to be so interesting that i suggest i used to give away ten roubles and twenty-five roubles at a time to those who begged of me for a drink just a few coppers it's a lieutenant implores your aid a, a former lieutenant begging of you our road was suddenly barred by the figure of a tall beggar possibly in fact a retired lieutenant what was more singular was that he was very well dressed for his profession and yet he was begging three i purposely do not omit this paltry incident of the wretched lieutenant for my picture of versilov is not complete without the petty details of his surroundings at that minute which was so momentous for him momentous it was and i did not know it if you don't leave off sir i shall call the police at once versilov said suddenly raising his voice unnaturally and standing still before the lieutenant i could never imagine such anger from a man so philosophic and for such a trivial cause and note our conversation was interrupted at the point of most interest to him as he had just said himself what you haven't a five kopeck piece the lieutenant cried rudely waving his hand in the air and indeed what canaille have five kopecks nowadays the low rabble the scoundrels he goes dressed in beaver and makes all this to do about a copper constable cried versilov but there was no need to shout a policeman was standing close by at the corner and he had heard the lieutenant abuse himself i ask you to bear witness to this insult i ask you to come to the police station said versilov oh ho i don't care there's nothing at all you can prove you won't show yourself so wonderfully clever keep hold of him constable and take us to the police station versilov decided emphatically surely we are not going to the police station bother the fellow i whispered to him certainly we are dear boy the disorderly behaviour in our streets begins to bore one beyond endurance and if every one did his duty it would make it better for us all c'est comique mais c'est ce que nous ferons for a hundred paces the lieutenant kept up a bold and swaggering demeanour and talked with heat he declared that it was not the thing to do that it was all a matter of five kopecks and so on and so on but at last he began whispering something to the policeman the policeman a sagacious man with apparently a distaste for exhibitions of nerves in the street seemed to be on his side though only to a certain degree he muttered in an undertone in reply that it was too late for that now that it had gone too far and that if you were to apologize for instance and the gentleman would consent to accept your apology then perhaps come li listen honoured sir where are we going i ask you what are we hurrying to and what's the joke of it the lieutenant cried aloud if a man who is down on his luck is willing to make an apology in fact if you want to put him down damn it all we are not in a drawing-room we are in the street for the street that's apology enough versilov stopped and suddenly burst out laughing i actually imagined that he had got the whole thing up for amusement but it was not so i entirely accept your apology monsieur l'officier and i assure you that you are a man of ability behave like that in the drawing-room it will soon pass muster perfectly there too and meanwhile here are twenty kopecks for you eat and drink your fill with it pardon me constable for troubling you i would have thanked you more substantially for your pains but you are so highly respectable nowadays my dear boy he added turning to me there's an eating-house close here it's really a horrible sewer but one could get tea there and i invite you to a cup this way quite close come along i repeat i had never seen him so excited though his face was full of brightness and gaiety yet i noticed that when he was taking the coin out of his purse to give it to the officer his hands trembled and his fingers refused to obey him so that at last he asked me to take out the money and give it to the man for him i cannot forget it he took me to a little restaurant on the canal side in the basement 
the customers were few a loud barrel organ was playing out of tune there was a smell of dirty dinner napkins we sat down in a corner perhaps you don't know i am sometimes so bored so horribly bored in my soul that i like coming to all sorts of stinking holes like this these surroundings the halting tune from lucia the waiters in their unseemly russian get-up the fumes of cheap tobacco the shouts from the billiard-room it's all so vulgar and prosaic that it almost borders on the fantastic well my dear boy that son of mars interrupted us i believe at the most interesting moment here's the tea i like the tea here imagine p otra ippolitovitch suddenly began to-day assuring the other lodger the one marked with smallpox that during the last century a special committee of lawyers was appointed in the english parliament to examine the trial of christ before the high priest and pilate with the sole object of finding how the case would have gone nowadays by modern law and that the inquiry was conducted with all solemnity with counsel for the prosecution and all the rest of it and that the jury were obliged to uphold the original verdict a wonderful story that fool of a lodger began to argue about it lost his temper quarrelled and declared he should leave next day the landlady dissolved in tears at the thought of losing his rent mais passons in these restaurants they sometimes have nightingales do you know the old moscow anecdote a la piotr ipolitovitch a nightingale was singing in a moscow restaurant a merchant came in i must have my fancy whatever it costs said he what's the price of the nightingale a hundred roubles roast it and serve it so they roasted it and served it up cut me off to penworth i once told it to p otra ipolitovitch but he did not believe it and was quite indignant he said a great deal more i quote these fragments as a sample of his talk he repeatedly interrupted me every time i opened my mouth to begin my story he began each time talking of some peculiar and utterly irrelevant nonsense he talked gaily excitedly laughed goodness knows what at and even chuckled in an undignified way as i had never seen him do before he swallowed a glass of tea at one gulp and poured out another now i can understand it he was like a man who had received a precious interesting and long expected letter and who lays it down before him and purposely refrains from opening it turning it over and over in his hands examining the envelope and the seal going to see to things in another room in short deferring the interesting moment of perusal knowing that it cannot escape him and all this he does to make his enjoyment more complete i told him all there was to tell of course everything from the very beginning and it took me perhaps an hour telling it and indeed how could i have helped telling him i had been dying to talk of it that afternoon i began with our very first meeting at the old prince's on the day she arrived from moscow then i described how it had all come about by degrees i left nothing out and indeed i could not have left anything out he led me on he guessed what was coming and prompted me at moments it seemed to me that something fantastic was happening that he must have been sitting or standing behind the door for those two months he knew beforehand every gesture i made every feeling i had felt i derived infinite enjoyment from this confession to him for i found in him such intimate softness such deep psychological subtlety such a marvellous faculty for guessing what i meant from half a word he listened as tenderly as a woman and above all he knew how to save me from feeling ashamed at times he stopped me at some detail often when he stopped me he repeated nervously don't forget details the great thing is not to forget any details the more minute a point is the more important it may sometimes be and he interrupted me several times with words to that effect oh of course i began at first in a tone of superiority superiority to her but i quickly dropped into sincerity i told him honestly that i was ready to kiss the spot on the floor where her foot had rested the most beautiful and glorious thing was that he absolutely understood that she might be suffering from terror over the letter and yet remain the pure and irreproachable being she had revealed herself to be he absolutely realized what was meant by the word student but when i was near the end of my story i noticed that behind his good-natured smile there were signs in his face from time to time of some impatience some abruptness and preoccupation when i came to the letter i thought to myself shall i tell him the exact truth or not and i did not tell it in spite of my enthusiasm 
i note this here that i may remember it all my life i explained to him as i had done to her that it had been destroyed by craft his eyes began to glow a strange line a line of deep gloom was visible on his forehead you are sure you remember my dear boy that the letter was burned by craft in the candle you are not mistaken i am not mistaken i repeated the point is that that scrap of paper is of such importance to her and if you had only had it in your hands to-day you might but what i might he did not say but you haven't it in your hands now i shuddered all over inwardly but not outwardly outwardly i did not betray myself i did not turn a hair but i was still unwilling to believe in the question haven't it in my hands in my hands now how could i since craft burned it that day yes a glowing intent look was fastened upon me a look i shall never forget he smiled however but all his good nature all the feminine softness that had been in his expression suddenly vanished it was replaced by something vague and troubled he became more and more preoccupied if he had controlled himself at that moment as he had till then he would not have asked me that question about the letter he had asked it no doubt because he was carried away himself i say this however only now at the time i did not so quickly perceive the change that had come over him i still went on plunging and there was still the same music in my heart but my story was over i looked at him it's strange he said suddenly when i had told him everything to the minutest detail it's a very strange thing my dear boy you say that you were there from three o'clock till four and that tatiana pavlovna was not at home from three o'clock till half-past four exactly well only fancy i went to see tatiana pavlovna exactly at half-past four to the minute and she met me in the kitchen i nearly always go to see her by the back entrance what she met you in the kitchen i cried staggering back in amazement as she told me she could not ask me in i only stayed two minutes i only looked in to ask her to come to dinner perhaps she had only just come home from somewhere i don't know of course not though she was wearing a loose dressing-gown that was at half-past four exactly but tatiana pavlovna didn't tell you i was there no she did not tell me you were there otherwise i should have known it and should not have asked you about it listen that's awfully important yes from a certain point of view and you've turned quite white my dear but after all what is there important in it they've been laughing at me as though i were a baby it's simply that she was afraid of your impulsiveness as she expressed it herself and so she felt safer with tatiana pavlovna there but good god what a trick think she let me say all that before a third person before tatiana pavlovna so she heard everything i said it it's horrible to conceive of say salon mon cher besides you spoke just now of breadth of view in regard to women and exclaimed hurrah for breadth if i were othello and you iago you could not have done better i am laughing though there can be no sort of othello because there have been no relations of the kind and why laugh indeed it doesn't matter i believe she's infinitely above me all the same and i have not lost my ideal if it was a joke on her part i forgive her a joke with a wretched raw youth doesn't matter besides i did not pose as anything and the student the student was there in her soul and remained there in spite of everything it was in her heart it exists there and would always exist there enough listen what do you think shall i go to her at once to find out the whole truth or not i said i am laughing but there were tears in my eyes well my dear boy go if you want to i feel as though i were defiled in soul from having told you all this don't be angry dear but i repeat one can't tell things about a woman to a third person no confidant will understand even an angel wouldn't understand if you respect a woman don't confide in any one if you respect yourself don't confide in any one now i don't respect myself good-bye for the present i can't forgive myself nonsense my dear boy you exaggerate you say yourself that there was nothing in it we came out on the canal bank and said good-bye will you never give me a real warm kiss as a child kisses its father he said with a strange quiver in his voice i kissed him fervently dear boy may you be always as pure in heart as you are now i had never kissed him before in my life i never could have conceived that he would like me to End of part two chapter five
part two chapter six of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part two chapter six i'll go of course i made up my mind as i hurried home i'll go at once very likely i shall find her at home alone whether she is alone or with someone else makes no difference i can ask her to come out to me she will receive me she'll be surprised but she will receive me and if she won't see me i'll insist on her seeing me i'll send in word that it's most urgent she will think it's something about that letter and will see me and i'll find out all about tatiana there and what then if i am not right i will be her servant if i am right and she is to blame it's the end of everything in any case it's the end of everything what am i going to lose i can lose nothing i'll go i'll go i shall never forget and i recall with pride that i did not go it will never be known to any one it will die with me but it's enough that i know of it and at such a moment i was capable of an honourable impulse this is a temptation and i will put it behind me i made up my mind at last on second thoughts they had tried to terrify me with a fact but i refused to believe it and had not lost my faith in her purity and what had i to go for what was there to find out about why was she bound to believe in me as i did in her to have faith in my purity not to be afraid of my impulsiveness and not to provide against all risks with tatiana i had not yet as far as she could see deserved her confidence no matter no matter that she does not know that i am worthy of it that i am not seduced by temptations that i do not believe in malicious calumnies against her i know it and i shall respect myself for it i shall respect my own feeling oh yes she had allowed me to utter everything before tatiana she had allowed tatiana to be there she knew that tatiana was sitting there listening for she was incapable of not listening she knew that she was laughing at me out there that was awful awful but but what if it were impossible to avoid it what could she have done in her position and how could one blame her for it why i had told her a lie about craft i had deceived her because that too could not be helped and i had lied innocently against my will my god i cried suddenly flushing painfully what have i just done myself haven't i exposed her too before tatiana haven't i repeated it all to versilov just now though after all there was a difference it was only a question of the letter i had in reality only told versilov about the letter because there was nothing else to tell and could be nothing else was not i the first to declare that there could not be he was a man of insight hmm. but what hatred there was in his heart for this woman even to this day and what sort of drama must have taken place between them in the past and about what all due to vanity of course versilov cannot be capable of any feeling but boundless vanity that last thought rose spontaneously in my mind and i did not even remark it such were the thoughts that floated through my mind one after another and i was straightforward with myself i did not cheat or deceive myself and if there was anything i did not understand at that moment it was not from sophistry with myself but only from lack of brains i returned home in great excitement and 
i don't know why in a very cheerful though confused state of mind but i was afraid of analysing my feelings and did my utmost to distract my mind i went in at once to see my landlady it turned out that a terrible quarrel really had taken place between her husband and her she was in advanced consumption and though perhaps she was a good-natured woman like all consumptives she was of uncertain temper i began trying to reconcile them at once i went to the lodger who was a very vain little bank clerk called to Cherviac, a coarse pock-marked fool i disliked him very much but i got on with him quite well for i often was so mean as to join him in turning piotr ipolitovitch into ridicule i at once persuaded him to keep on the lodgings and indeed he would not in any case have really gone so far as to move it ended in my reassuring the landlady completely and even succeeding in very deftly putting a pillow under her head piotr ipolitovitch would never have known how to do it she commented malignantly then i busied myself in the kitchen preparing mustard plasters for her and succeeded in making two capital ones with my own hand poor pietro ipolitovitch looked on envious but i did not allow him to touch them and was rewarded by liberal tears of gratitude from the lady i remember i suddenly felt sick of it all and suddenly realized that i was not looking after the invalid from kindness at all but from something else some very different motive i waited for matvey with nervous impatience i had resolved that evening to try my luck at cards for the last time and, and apart from my need to win i had an intense longing to play but for that my excitement would have been unbearable if i had not gone anywhere i might have been unable to hold out and should have gone to her it was almost time for matvey to come when the door was opened and an unexpected visitor daria anna simovna walked in i frowned and was surprised she knew my lodging for she had been there once with some message from my mother i made her sit down and looked at her inquiringly she said nothing and only looked straight into my face with a deferential smile you've not come from liza it occurred to me to ask no it's nothing special i informed her that i was just going out she replied again that it was nothing special and that she was going herself in a minute i suddenly for some reason felt sorry for her i may observe that she had met with a great deal of sympathy from all of us from my mother and still more from tatiana pavlovna but after installing her at madame stolbiev's all of us had rather begun to forget her except perhaps liza who often visited her i think she was herself the cause of this neglect for she had a special faculty for effacing herself and holding herself aloof from people in spite of her obsequiousness and her ingratiating smiles i personally disliked those smiles of hers and her affected expression and i even imagined on one occasion that she had not grieved very long for her olia but this time for some reason i felt very sorry for her and behold without uttering a word she suddenly bent forward with her eyes cast down and all at once throwing her arms round my waist hid her face on my knees she seized my hand i thought she meant to kiss it but she pressed it to her eyes and hot tears trickled upon it she was shaking all over with sobs but she wept silently it sent a pang to my heart even though i felt at the same time somehow annoyed but she was embracing me with perfect confidence and without the least fear that i might be vexed though only just before she had smiled so timidly and cringingly i began begging her to calm herself kind good friend i don't know what to do with myself as soon as it gets dark i can't bear it as soon as it gets dark i can't go on bearing it and i feel drawn into the street into the darkness and i am drawn there by my imaginings my mind is possessed by the fancy that as soon as ever i go out i shall meet her in the street i walk and seem to see her that is other girls are walking along the street and i walk behind them on purpose and i think isn't it she there she is i think it really is my olia 
i dream and dream i turn giddy at last and feel sick and stumble and jostle against people i stumble as though i were drunk and some swear at me i hide by myself and don't go to see any one and wherever one goes it makes one's heart more sick i passed by your lodging just now and thought i'll go in to him he is kinder than any of them and he was there at the time forgive a poor creature who's no use to any one i'll go away directly i'm going she suddenly got up and made haste to depart motley arrived just then i made her get into the sledge with me and left her at madame stobiev's on my way two i had of late begun to frequent zertchikoff's gambling saloon i had so far visited three gambling houses always in company with prince sergey who had introduced me to these places at one of these houses the game was faro especially and the stakes were high but i did not care for going there i saw that one could not get on there without a long purse and also that the place was crowded with insolent fellows and swaggering young snobs this was what prince sergey liked he liked playing too but he particularly liked getting to know these young prodigals i noticed that though he went in with me he kept away from me during the evening and did not introduce me to any of his set i stared about me like a wild man of the woods so much so that i sometimes attracted attention at the gambling table people spoke to one another freely but once i tried bowing next day to a young fop with whom i had not only talked but laughed the previous evenings sitting beside him and had even guessed two cards from him yet when i greeted him in the same room next day he actually did not recognize me or what was worse stared at me with simulated amazement and passed by with a smile so i quickly gave up the place and preferred to visit a sewer i don't know what else to call it it was a wretched sordid little place for roulette managed by a kept woman who however never showed herself in the saloon it was all horribly free and easy there and though officers and wealthy merchants sometimes frequented it there was a squalid filthiness about the place though that was an attraction to many moreover i was often lucky there but i gave that place up too after a disgusting scene which occurred when the game was at its hottest and ended in a fight between two players i began going instead of zertschikoff's to which prince sergey took me also the man was a retired captain and the tone at his rooms was very tolerable military curt and business-like and there was a fastidiously scrupulous keeping up of the forms of punctilio no boisterous practical jokers or very fast men frequented it moreover the stakes played for were often considerable both faro and roulette were played i had only been there twice before that evening the fifteenth of november but i believe zertschikoff already knew me by sight i had made no acquaintance there however as luck would have it prince sergey did not turn up till about midnight when he dropped in with darzen after spending the evening at the gambling saloon of the young snobs which i had given up and so that evening i found myself alone and unknown in a crowd of strangers if i had a reader and he had read all i have written so far of my adventures there would be certainly no need to inform him that i am not created for any sort of society the trouble is i don't know how to behave in company if i go anywhere among a great many people i always have a feeling as though i were being electrified by so many eyes looking at me it positively makes me shrivel up physically shrivel up even in such places as a theatre to say nothing of private houses i did not know how to behave with dignity in these gambling saloons and assemblies i either sat still inwardly upbraiding myself for my excessive mildness and politeness or i suddenly got up and did something rude and meanwhile all sorts of worthless fellows far inferior to me knew how to behave with wonderful aplomb and that's what exasperated me above everything so that i lost my self-possession more and more i may say frankly even at that time if the truth is to be told the society there and even winning money at cards had become revolting and a torture to me positively a torture i did of course derive acute enjoyment from it but this enjoyment was at the cost of torture the whole thing the people 
the gambling and most of all myself in the midst of them seemed horribly nasty as soon as i win i'll chuck it all up i said to myself every time when i woke up in my lodgings in the morning after gambling overnight then again how account for my desire to win since i certainly was not fond of money not that i am going to repeat the hackneyed phrases usually in such explanations that i played for the sake of the game for the pleasure of it for the risk the excitement and so on and not for gain i was horribly in need of money and though this was not my chosen path not my idea yet somehow or other i had made up my mind to try it by way of experiment i was continually possessed by one overwhelming thought you maintained that one could reckon with certainty on becoming a millionaire if only one had sufficient strength of will you've tested your strength of will already so show yourself as strong in this case can more strength of will be needed for roulette than for your idea that is what i kept repeating to myself and as i still retain the conviction that in games of chance if one has perfect control of one's will so that the subtlety of one's intelligence and one's power of calculation are preserved one cannot fail to overcome the brutality of blind chance and to win i naturally could not help growing more and more irritated when at every moment i failed to preserve my strength of will and was carried away by excitement like a regular child though i was able to endure hunger i am not able to control myself in an absurd thing like this that was what provoked me moreover the consciousness that however absurd and abject i might seem i had within me a rich store of strength which would one day make them all change their opinion of me that consciousness has been from the days of my oppressed childhood the one spring of life for me my light my dignity my weapon and my consolation without which i might have committed suicide as a little child and so how could i help being irritated when i saw what a pitiful creature i became at the gambling table that is why i could not give up playing i see it all clearly now this was the chief reason but apart from that my petty vanity was wounded losing had lowered me in the eyes of prince sergey of versilov though he did not deign to speak of it of every one even of tatiana pavlovna that is what i thought i felt finally i will make another confession by that time i had begun to be corrupted it had become hard for me to give up a dinner of seven dishes at the restaurant to give up matfi and the english shop to lose the good opinion of my hairdresser and all that in fact i was conscious of it even at the time but i refused to admit the thought now i blush to write it three finding myself alone in a crowd of strangers i established myself at first at a corner of the table and began staking small sums i remained sitting there without stirring for two hours for those two hours the play was horribly flat neither one thing nor another i let slip some wonderful chances and tried not to lose my temper but to preserve my coolness and confidence at the end of the two hours i had neither lost nor won out of my three hundred roubles i had lost ten or fifteen roubles this trivial result exasperated me and what's more an exceedingly unpleasant disgusting incident occurred i know that such gambling saloons are frequented by thieves who are not simply pickpockets out of the street but well-known gamblers i am certain that the well-known gambler afredov is a thief he is still to be seen about the town i met him not long ago driving a pair of his own ponies but he is a thief and he stole from me but this incident i will describe later what happened this evening was simply a prelude i spent there two hours sitting at a corner of the table and beside me on the left there was all the time an abominable little dandy a jew i believe he is on some paper though and even writes something and gets it published at the very last moment i suddenly won twenty roubles two red notes lay before me and suddenly i saw this wretched little jew put out his hand and remove one of my notes i tried to stop him but with a most impudent air he immediately informed me 
without raising his voice in the least that it was what he had won that he had just put down a stake and won it he declined to continue the conversation and turned away as ill luck would have it i was in a state of extreme stupidity at that moment i was brooding over a great idea and with a curse i got up quickly and walked away i did not want to dispute so made him a present of the red note and indeed it would have been difficult to go into the matter with an impudent thief for i had let slip the right moment and the game was going on again and that was my great mistake the effect of which was apparent later on three or four players near us saw how the matter ended and noticing how easily i had given way took me for another of the same sort it was just twelve o'clock i walked into the other room and after little reflection formed a new plan going back i changed my notes at the bank for half imperials i received over forty of them i divided them into ten lots and resolved to stake four half imperials ten times running on the zero if i win it's my luck if i lose so much the better i'll never play again i may mention that zero had not turned up once during those two hours so that at last no one was staking on zero i put down my stake standing silent frowning and clenching my teeth at the third round zertschikoff called aloud zero which had not turned up all day a hundred and forty half imperials were counted out to me in gold i had seven chances left and i went on though everything seemed whirling round and dancing before my eyes come here i shouted right across the table to a player beside whom i had been sitting before a grey-headed man with a moustache and a purple face wearing evening dress who had been for some hours staking small sums with ineffable patience and losing stake after stake come this end there's luck here are you speaking to me the moustached gentleman shouted from the other end of the table with a note of menacing surprise in his voice yes you you'll go on losing for ever there that's not your business please not to interfere but i could not restrain myself an elderly officer was sitting facing me at the other side of the table looking at my stake he muttered to his neighbour that's queer zero no i won't venture on zero do colonel i shouted laying down another stake kindly leave me alone and don't force your advice upon me he rapped out sharply you are making too much noise i am giving you good advice would you like to bet on zeros turning up directly ten gold pieces i'll bet that will you take it and i laid down ten half imperials a bet of ten gold pieces that i can do he brought out dryly and severely i'll bet against you that zero won't turn up ten louis d'or colonel what do you mean by ten louis d'or ten half imperials colonel and in grand language ten louis d'or well then say they are half imperials and please don't joke with me i did not of course hope to win the bet there were thirty-six chances against one that zero would not turn up again but i proposed it out of swagger and because i wanted to attract every one's attention i quite saw that for some reason nobody here liked me and that they all would have taken particular pleasure in letting me know it the roulette wheel was sent spinning and what was the general amazement when it stopped at zero again there was actually a general shout the glory of my success dazed me completely again a hundred and forty half imperials were counted out to me zertschikoff asked me if i would not like to take part of them in notes but i mumbled something inarticulate in reply for i was literally incapable of expressing myself in a calm and definite way my head was going round and my legs felt weak i suddenly felt that i would take a fearful risk at once moreover i had a longing to do something more to make another bet to carry off some thousands from some one mechanically i scooped up my notes and gold in the hollow of my hand and could not collect myself to count them at that moment i noticed prince sergey and darzen behind me they had only just come from their pharaoh saloon where as i heard afterwards they had lost their last farthing ah darzen i cried there's luck here stake on zero i've been losing i've no money he answered dryly prince sergey actually appeared not to notice or recognize me here's money i cried pointing to my heap of gold as much as you like hang it all cried darzen flushing crimson i didn't ask you for money i believe you are being called said zertschikoff pulling my arm the colonel who had lost ten half imperials to me had called to me several times almost abusingly 
kindly take this he shouted purple with rage it's not for me to stand over you but if i don't you'll be saying afterwards you haven't had the money count it i trust you i trust you colonel without counting only please don't shout at me like that and don't be angry and i drew his heap of gold towards me sir i beg you to keep your transports for some one else and not to force them on me the colonel rasped out i've never fed pigs with you it's queer to admit such people who is he only a lad i heard exclamations in undertones but i did not listen i was staking at random not on zero this time i staked a whole heap of hundred rouble notes on the first eighteen numbers let's go darzen i heard prince sergey's voice behind me home i asked turning round to them wait for me we'll go together i've had enough my stake won i had gained a big sum enough i cried and without counting the money i began with trembling hands gathering up the gold and dropping it into my pockets and clumsily crumpling the notes in my fingers and trying to stuff them all at once into my side pocket suddenly afrodov who was sitting next to me on the right had been playing for high stakes laid a fat hand with a ring on the first finger over three of my hundred rouble notes excuse me that's not yours he brought out sternly and incisively though he spoke rather softly this was the prelude which was destined a few days afterwards to have such a serious sequel now i swear on my honour those three notes were mine but to my misfortune at the time though i was convinced they were mine i still had the fraction of a doubt and for an honest man that is enough and i am an honest man what made all the difference was that i did not know at the time that afrodov was a thief i did not even know his name then so that at that moment i might very well imagine i had made a mistake and that those three notes were really not in the heap that had just been paid me i had not counted my gains at all i had simply gathered up the heaps with my hands and there had been money lying in front of afrodov too and quite close to mine but in neat heaps and counted above all afrodov was known here and looked upon as a wealthy man he was treated with respect all this had an influence on me and again i did not protest a terrible mistake the whole beastly incident was a result of my enthusiasm i'm awfully sorry i don't remember for certain but i really think they are mine i brought out with lips trembling with indignation these words at once aroused a murmur to say things like that you ought to remember for certain but you've graciously announced yourself that you don't remember for certain afrodov observed with insufferable superciliousness who is he it can't be allowed i heard several exclamations that's not the first time he has done it there was the same little game over a ten-rouble note with Regberg just now a mean little voice said somewhere near that's enough that's enough i exclaimed i'm not protesting take it where's prince where are prince sokolsky and darzen have they gone gentlemen did you see which way prince sokolsky and darzen went and gathering up all my money at last i could not succeed in getting some of the half imperials into my pocket and holding them in my hands i rushed to overtake prince sergey and darzen the reader will see i think that i don't spare myself and am recording at this moment what i was then and all my nastiness so as to explain the possibility of what followed prince sergey and darzen were going downstairs without taking the slightest notice of my shouts and calls to them i had overtaken them but i stopped for a moment before the hall porter and goodness knows why thrust three half imperials into his hand he gazed at me in amazement and did not even thank me but that was nothing to me and if matvi had been there i should probably have pressed handfuls of gold upon him and so indeed i believe i meant to do but as i ran out on the steps i suddenly remembered that i had let him go home when i arrived at that moment prince sergey's horse came up and he got into his sledge i'm coming with you prince into your flat i cried clutching the fur cover and throwing it open to get into the empty seat but all at once stars and skipped past me into the sledge and the coachman snatched the fur cover out of my hands and tucked it round them damn it all i cried dumbfounded it looked as though i had unbuttoned the cover for darzen's benefit like a flunkey home shouted prince sergey stop i roared clutching at the sledge but the horse started and i was sent rolling in the snow i even fancied they were laughing jumping up i took the first sledge i came across and dashed after prince sergey urging on the wretched nag at every second four 
as ill luck would have it the wretched beast crawled along with unnatural slowness though i promised the driver a whole rouble the driver did nothing but lash the beast to earn his rouble my heart was sinking i began trying to talk to the driver but i could not even articulate my words and i muttered something incoherent this was my condition when i ran up to prince sergey's he had only just come back he had left darzen on the way and was alone pale and ill-humoured he was pacing up and down his study i repeat again he had lost heavily that evening he looked at me with a sort of preoccupied wonder you again he brought out frowning to settle up with you for good sir i said breathlessly how dared you treat me like that he looked at me inquiringly if you meant to drive with darzen you might have answered that you were going with him but you started your horse and i-oh yes you tumbled into the snow he said and laughed into my face an insult like that can be only answered with a challenge so to begin with we'll settle accounts and with a trembling hand i began pulling out my money and laying it on the sofa on the marble table and even on an open book in heaps and handfuls and in rolls of notes several coins rolled on the carpet oh yes you've won it seems one can tell that from your tone he had never spoken to me so insolently before i was very pale here i don't know how much it must be counted i owe you three thousand or how much more or less i'm not pressing you to pay i believe no it's i want to pay and you ought to know why i know that in that roll there's a thousand roubles here and i began with trembling fingers to count the money but gave it up it doesn't matter i know it's a thousand well that thousand i will keep for myself but all the rest all these heaps take for what i owe you for part of what i owe you i think there's as much as two thousand or maybe more but you are keeping a thousand for yourself then said prince sergey with a grin do you want it in that case i was meaning i was thinking you didn't wish it but if you want it here it is no you need not he said turning away from me contemptuously and beginning to pace up and down again and what the devil's put it into your head to want to pay it back he said turning to me suddenly with a horrible challenge in his face i'm paying it back to be free to insist on your giving me satisfaction i vociferated go to the devil with your everlasting words and gesticulations he stamped at me suddenly as though in a frenzy i've been wanting to get rid of you both for ages you and your versalov you've gone out of your mind i shouted and indeed it did look like it you've worried me to death with your high-sounding phrases and never anything but phrases 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 of honour for instance to foo i've been wanting to have done with you for a long time i'm glad glad that the minute has come i considered myself bound and blushed that i was forced to receive you both but now i don't consider myself bound in any way in any way let me tell you your versalov induced me to attack madame Amakoff and to cast aspersions on her don't dare to talk of honour to me after that for you are dishonourable people both of you both of you i wonder you weren't ashamed to take my money there was a darkness before my eyes i borrowed from you as a comrade i began speaking with a dreadful quietness you offered it to me yourself and i believed in your affection i'm not your comrade that's not why i have given you money you know why it is i borrowed on account of what you owed versalov of course it was stupid but i you could not borrow on versalov's account without his permission and i could not have given you his money without his permission i gave you my own money and you knew it knew it and took it and i allowed this hateful farce to go on in my house what did i know what farce why did you give it to me pour vos vos yeux mon cousin he said laughing straight in my face go to hell i cried take it all here's the other thousand too now we are quits and to-morrow and i flung at him the roll of hundred rouble notes i had meant to keep to live upon the notes hit him in the waistcoat and flopped on the floor with three rapid strides he stepped close up to me do you dare to tell me he said savagely articulating his words as it were syllable by syllable that all this time you've been taking my money you did not know your sister was with child by me what what i screamed and suddenly my legs gave way under me and i sank helplessly on the sofa he told me himself afterwards that i literally turned as white as a handkerchief i was stunned i remember we still stared into each other's faces in silence a look of dismay passed over his face he suddenly bent down took me by the shoulder and began supporting me i distinctly remember his set smile in which there was incredulity and wonder yes he had never dreamed of his words having such an effect for he was absolutely convinced of my knowledge 
it ended in my fainting but only for a moment i came to myself i got on my feet gazed at him and reflected and suddenly the whole truth dawned upon my mind which had been so slow to awaken if some one had told me of it before and asked me what i should have done at such a moment i should no doubt have answered that i should have torn him in pieces but what happened was quite different and quite independent of my will i suddenly covered my face with both hands and began sobbing bitterly it happened of itself all at once the child came out again in the young man it seemed that fully half of my soul was still a child's i fell on the sofa and sobbed out liza liza poor unhappy girl prince sergey was completely convinced all at once good god how unjust i've been to you he cried in deep distress how abominably i've misjudged you in my suspiciousness forgive me arkady makarovitch i suddenly jumped up tried to say something to him stood facing him but said nothing and ran out of the room and out of the flat i dragged myself home on foot and don't know how i got there i threw myself on the bed in the dark buried my face in the pillow and thought and thought at such moments orderly and consecutive thought is never possible my brain and imagination seemed torn to shreds and i remember i began dreaming about something utterly irrelevant i don't know what my grief and trouble came back to my mind suddenly with an ache of anguish and i wrung my hands again and exclaimed liza liza and began crying again i don't remember how i fell asleep but i slept sweetly and soundly End of part two chapter six